Today, we're going to read about every evangelist's dream. Hi, I'm David Servant, and this is Heavenward TV. Thank you so much for joining me one more time as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. And today, once again, we're back in the book of Acts, but not for long. Because we're doing a chronological study, it won't be too long, and I won't tell you exactly when yet, that we'll be heading over to the first epistle written, James. But today, we're in Acts chapter 8, and starting in verse number 25. Just to give you the background real quickly here, uh, Philip has gone uh, down to Samaria, which uh, down doesn't mean south. In this case, down means down in altitude from Jerusalem to Samaria, which is north of Jerusalem, and preached the gospel to the Samaritans. It was a cross-cultural missionary effort, uh, great receptivity there, great signs and wonders through Philip. Peter and John ultimately came down, prayed for those new converts, those new New believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And we just finished that story last time when Simon saw something really fantastic, even more fantastic than what he had been seeing, tried to buy the power to impart the Holy Spirit to people, and he got a firm re rebuke from, from Peter. All right, so that's wrapped up now. Peter and John have accomplished their assignment, and now in verse number 25 of Acts chapter 8. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So they're taking the cue from uh, Philip's groundbreaking ministry. Now the gospel has be, is, is starting to spread where Jesus always wanted it spread, he said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of earth. So they're in Samaria preaching the gospel to people who would naturally be their enemies. But Christ uh, reconciles us one with another, doesn't he? And when we believe in him, uh, uh, we become brothers and sisters with everyone else who's believed in him, regardless of how much we may have hated them before. All of that prejudice and racism is gone because we know now we have have the same father. May I point out to you one little thing out of Acts 8.25, one word. It said there that they solemnly testified and spoke the word of the Lord. You know, um, there is a time for joy and levity. Uh, I guess joy, there's always a time for that if it's something that's a, a spiritual joy. But when you preach the, uh, the gospel, to, to make it, you know, a comedy routine just doesn't seem to be appropriate because we're talking about things of even greater importance than life or death. This is eternity, eternal life or eternal death, right? And so to make a joke about that, it, it, it's just not going to convince our hearers that this is really as serious as it actually is. And so let's fit the part when we share the gospel. It'd be good to weep some tears uh, for those who are not receiving it. All right, let's move on into Acts 8.26. In the New American Standard, it is a new paragraph, and this begins to highlight now um, Philip's ongoing ministry. Look at this now, uh, verse 26. But an angel of the Lord said to Philip, saying, quote, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Parenthetically, Luke tells us this is a desert road. Well, at that time he was in Samaria, so he's north of Jerusalem and he's gonna go south to the, the, the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Anywhere you go from Jerusalem, it's a descent, okay? And, and so it's possible that he had to go back through Jerusalem then to begin get on the, to get on that Gaza road. And um, so he, he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. So the guy used some of the queen's money or his own money and got a copy. Wow, not a cheap thing, a handwritten copy of the uh, writings of Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Now, if you know the story, you know that uh, you know, Philip was sent all that distance to talk to one man. 
And I think this is the sign, one sign of the true evangelist, those guys who only preach the great crusades and never have time to share one-on-one -on -one with someone in the gospel because they're too high and mighty and important, they're, they're not like uh, Philip the evangelist was at all, are they? No, uh, and this is a commentary on all true servants of God. Uh, Philip had just had, you know, a, a, an, really an earth-shattering campaign up there in Samaria. I mean, signs, wonders, and miracles, you know, multitudes of people giving him attention. Simon the magician turns to the Lord. People are being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Lame people are being healed. I mean, he had a real following up there, which he could have built upon, but the Holy Spirit sent him to go talk to one man. Okay, uh, that's beautiful. And none of us should ever think that we've got, you know, a big ministry that uh, we reach a state where we're just too important to spend time ministering to one person. Goodness, Jesus set the example on that, didn't he? There's lots of examples of Jesus talking to one person. There's examples of Jesus taking time even for little children when the disciples thought he was much too important to give any of his time to them, but he said, you know, forbid them not to come to me such as these belongs God's kingdom. All right, so let's imitate Christ in this regard. And Philip was certainly setting a good example to imitate as well. Sent to one man. But not just any man, a man whom God knew was receptive. This is a guy who has taken his vacation time uh, not to go to the beach, but to go to Jerusalem all the way from Ethiopia in, uh, in Africa to get up there to worship God because he knows there's something right and true about what uh, the Israelites have. And not that all of them are... Uh, paragons of virtue in setting an example of what it means to be a true follower of God or a true follower of Christ. But, you know, still, they've got the Holy Scriptures. They've got a legacy of miracles and prophets and so forth. Anybody who has any intelligence and is spiritually hungry would be looking into this, okay? And that's going to lead them down the right path. All right, more to say about the Ethiopian eunuch. I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back, and welcome back to Acts chapter 8. We're looking at the story of Philip the Evangelist uh, sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch who was in charge of the treasure of the queen of the Ethiopians. So this is a very, very important guy, but a guy who was very hungry spiritually. And that's why he had made the effort to travel all the way from Ethiopia up to Jerusalem. And it says specifically, he went there to worship. He's heading back to Ethiopia now, uh, but as hungry as he is, and even though he's been to Jerusalem, nobody shared the gospel with him. You know, maybe he was there right after the time when the great persecution started and all the Christians were scattered. Um, I, we don't know the details, but it just is sad that a guy who's looking for truth would come to Jerusalem, the, the epicenter of the early church, and gets out of there without hearing the gospel. He was a big shot, and maybe that's why also he never got a chance to mingle with uh, the average person. But yet, yet again, you know, we've been reading about miracles in Jerusalem that were extraordinary. Everybody would have been talking about it, and so it's just hard to understand how this guy missed all of that unless, again, he came up right after the persecution. So in any case, uh, God cares about this guy, and he sends uh, Philip uh, the evangelist uh, quite a distance north of Jerusalem, now to south of Jerusalem, to wait along this desert road that goes to Gaza. Here comes this guy in a chariot, and the, the Holy Spirit says to him, we read this last time in Acts 8.29, go up and join this chariot. And lo and behold, it's really a strategic time to be joining that chariot because this guy has purchased a scroll of Isaiah. And just as Philip is along the road, uh, the guy's, uh, and, and this guy comes by where he's standing. Um, well, let's read it in verse number 30. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? Okay, so goodness gracious. I mean, what an opportunity this would be. Uh, wouldn't you love that to happen to you where you happen along somebody who's reading the Bible and doesn't understand what they're reading and better yet, 
reading from the book of Isaiah and wait till you see what verses and what chapter he was reading from. I mean, it's, wow, it's so amazing and the, the providence of God, how he worked all of this out. May I just stop and interject here for a moment that, you know, this is an example of the fact that God knows the hearts of everybody and he knows whose hearts are getting closer to him on the, on the spiritual journey towards him and he knows whose hearts are getting harder and harder and getting further and further away from him. And so God, who knows the hearts of all men, is certainly able to lead his preachers and teachers and his representatives to those who are hungry. You know, uh, honestly, why would God, who's been trying to reach someone all of their life and who has become increasingly resistant to the voice of their conscience, the testimony of creation, and who is just you know hardening and hardening their heart more and more as God tries to reach them through, through those, those avenues and, and perhaps other avenues. Sometimes God uses calamity to try to get people's attention, you know, temporary judgments over, but a person hardening their heart all the years like, why would God then send someone to go tell that person the gospel? You say, well, maybe God just wants to hold him all that more accountable. Well, maybe so, but it, it, you know, if God is looking at this guy's heart and he says, there's no way this guy's going to receive the, the gospel because his heart's so hard already. He's just so deep into darkness, loves the darkness. We've been trying to reach him all of his life through other avenues. You know, God is the great evangelist. So why would God waste his time and waste one of his servants' time trying to reach one of those people when there's people like this, the Ethiopian eunuch, who are you know, just waiting for someone to come? Okay, so it behooves us to ask the Lord to help us bump into people like that, right? God, you know, explicitly told us, Jesus told us, don't cast your pearls before the swine, right? If they don't receive you, he said, dust, you know, shake the dust off your feet, go to the next city. God's not wanting his servants wasting their time. And I have in the past done, you know, canvassing of neighborhoods, knocking on doors, trying to, you know, marking off everybody that I talk to, trying to reach some of the gospel. And that can be mighty discouraging, mighty fast, let me tell you. Okay. And, and again, I'm not trying to discourage anyone from doing that. Uh, but boy, it just takes a real dose of the Holy Spirit to keep someone encouraged to keep on doing that unless they see some results. But who you know, what Christian would not want an opportunity like God gave Philip here? So Philip asks him in verse 30, do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, and he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? So he's reading, he doesn't know what he's reading, and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So this must have been a you know, pretty good-sized chariot. Don't just imagine one of those little Roman chariots in the Ben-Hur movies where they're racing. This was not a racing chariot. This was you know, a coach, as it were. Now, the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. Catch this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. That's the end. That's Isaiah chapter 53. I believe it's verses 7 and 8. And then eunuch answered, the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Well, I can imagine that in, inwardly Philip is, uh, you know, doing cartwheels with joy because this is the evangelist's dream. This is anybody's dream. Here's a guy reading Isaiah 53, the, the, the most messianic, prophetic scripture, the, you know, that describes what Christ accomplished for us on the cross reading it and wanting us to explain it to him. Oh my goodness, what a lovely opportunity. And so verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. All right, so there you have it. God lead us to receptive people you know their hearts. Okay, the story's not over. Can't wait to read the conclusion. I'll be right back.
All right, welcome back to Acts chapter 8 and this lovely story of Philip preaching the gospel to a very prepared and receptive Ethiopian eunuch, who, by the way, is going to be heading back down to Ethiopia, and only God knows what happened once he got back there as far as uh, himself uh, sharing the gospel that he himself had learned. All right, so he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah, which he's obtained in Jerusalem, and happens to be reading from what we would call the 53rd chapter, 7th and 8th verses. We read those. I want to take a moment and go back into Isaiah chapter 53 and just read a few of the verses there at the beginning of Isaiah 53. I'm sure it'll ring a bell for those of you that know the Bible fairly well. For those of you that don't, this is good for you to learn. Isaiah 53, this is a scripture about what Jesus did. I'll start with verse number 3. He was despised and forsaken of men. Have you heard that before? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. You might remember way back in Matthew chapter 8 when we studied there that the, uh, you know, the literal translation of the Hebrew is our sicknesses he himself bore and our pains he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Jesus was dying for our sins. Look at verse number five. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. All right? And so the next two verses are the very ones that uh, were quoted in Acts by Luke that, that um, the, the eunuch was reading at the very moment that uh, he was arrested by Philip. So we won't go on to, to read those, but there's just as messianic. And, and no doubt when Philip joined the chariot, he said, well, let's just go up a few verses here and let's read it all. And let me tell you about what Jesus did. He bore our sins on the cross. He is the Messiah. And uh, I mean, this was a lovely, lovely opportunity. I can remember uh, different times in my Christian life where I had beautiful chances to share the gospel with people who were so prepared by God. It was just the easiest thing in the world to lead them to the Lord. And uh, that's, a, as I said before, we ought to be praying for those opportunities. God knows the hearts of all men. Well, this was an easy convert, and apparently at some point in the conversation near the end, Philip explained to him that Jesus had commanded people to repent and that he had told them, his disciples rather, to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins and to go and make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so in verse number, 30, verse number 36, they went along the road, as they went along the road rather, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, quote, look, Water! What prevents me from being baptized? Oh, there you go. See, here's a heart that's just wide open. Whatever Jesus says, because I believe he's the Son of God, I want to do it. And if Jesus said to be baptized, I want to be baptized. What a stark contrast that is to those folks who say they're born again, but who have never submitted themselves to the waters of baptism because they're just not sure about it, you know. Besides, I was baptized as a baby in my church, you know, and blah, 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 blah. Oh, my goodness. You know, those people are not true converts. They're just fooling themselves. And so Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And so that's the point. You have to believe, but not just a mental assent, not just a pseudo belief, not just a half-hearted belief. But if you believe with all your heart, okay, I'll baptize you. And he responds and says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, someone is always apt to write me when we cover a verse like that and say, you see, it doesn't have anything to do with works. It's all by simple faith, and you can't add anything to that. Well, I agree, but in part, uh, I have to disagree. Because if you're saying that there, will, there, there won't be any consequent change of life as a result of a true belief, then and, you know, you're totally wrong, right? A, a, a living faith 
results in a a biblical lifestyle, uh, an ever-increasing obedience to the commandments of God as you learn them. And of course, this man didn't become sanctified in every sense right at that moment. No, he began his life as a baby Christian. And whatever he knew he was doing wrong, he repented of it. And as God revealed more and more to him as time went on, there were subsequent repentings as he became more Christ-like. And so this has an interesting end to the the story. He ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. So they wade out in the water, and down he goes. It signifies his, his identification with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And I would imagine that Philip explained a little bit of that to him to whatever degree he understood. You're now a a, a new person in Christ. The old person's dead. Now you're in Christ. Now Christ is in you by the Holy Spirit. Verse uh, number 39, when they came out of the water, now not right as he lifted the Ethiopian eunuch out of the water, but as they walked out of the water, wherever they were, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Oh my goodness, can you imagine that? Um, we're, We're walking out together. As soon as we get to the edge, I turn and look, and this guy, poof, he's gone. And this also tells us, at least in in a subtle way, that people who are truly born again, uh, the whole idea that's always emphasized that we have to follow up on them or or else they're in big trouble. Well, how did Philip follow up on this guy? God snatched him away. He just poof, disappeared. And this guy went on his way rejoicing. Let me tell you, people who really have Jesus, uh, you know, yes, their faith may be tested, but if they really get Jesus, a good percentage of them hang in there and stay with Jesus, even without that quote unquote, all important follow up. Okay, and I'm not discounting the importance of discipleship and getting with those new converts. Okay, well, we're out of time. Can't wait, though, till next time. We're going to start highlighting the story of Saul of Tarsus and his conversion. Can't wait. See you next time. Visit us online at heavenward.tv to view this and every episode of Heavenward TV for free. Watch the the behind-the-scenes videos. Read other teaching articles, books, and devotionals written by David Servant. And learn about other exciting ministries that David directs. All this and more is at heavenward.tv.